everybody. Well, just like that, the summer is over and it's absolutely frigid here. So before it gets really cold outside, I like to clean my birdhouses. You don't actually have to, you can just leave old nesting material there for the winter and then clean out uh, in the spring but I prefer to do this in the fall and then in the spring as well often mice will take over and spend the winter in those uh, birdhouses and some birds might roost when it gets really cold outside in the winter and it also gives me an opportunity to check if anything's been damaged when handling anything that wild birds use it is recommended to wear gloves and then wash birdhouses or bird feeders with a 110 bleach solution, scrub them with a brush, rinse them well, and then let them air dry. Uh, you can put them back just like that. I like to add a little bit of pine shavings or just dry grass to make it a little bit cozier for either mice that might be overwintering there or for roosting birds. <music> For the past month or so, Dr. Bird and his wife, Tony, have been touring in Europe celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And because they were in the countries where I used to spend quite a lot of time when I was younger, but unfortunately at that time I wasn't interested in birds at all, I was super curious to hear what kind of birds David and his wife were seeing on a daily basis. Well, after driving 4,000 kilometers in a rented car through Italy, and Croatia, here are my impressions of birds in uh, those two countries. Um, I think overall I was a bit um, uh, uh, concerned because I wasn't seeing any kind of serious bird life um, while driving through the countryside. I mean when you drive through North America, Canada, the United States, um, you know, even any time of the year you can see various kinds of birds of prey or waterfowl and bodies of water. Um, and so on. Now you're not going to see that many songbirds driving by the countryside in a car, but I was just um, a bit concerned about the lack of bird life that I saw overall in not just Italy but also Croatia. And um, I, I do realize that you know that these countries do have some pressures. I know, for example, that Italy um, has a uh, is struggling with the uh, poaching and hunting situation. Um, over six million birds are killed each year illegally in that country. Um, I'm also aware that the olive industry is responsible for vacuuming up birds by harvesting them at night with these big machines. But you know, my own country, I don't want to um, point fingers because our own countries, Canada, the United States, also have um, their problems with, uh, with bird life. Um, some of the more common birds that we saw all the time, of course, were um, feral pigeons in the city of Venice and yellow-legged gulls. In fact, yellow-legged gulls have become so numerous in Venice that some of the hotels are actually providing people, uh, tourists in the St. Mark's Square with orange squirt guns to, uh, to scare the birds away from their tables because they're aggressively taking food right off people's plates and out of their hands. And the orange color becomes a, a sort of a badge that don't go to this table. Um, but by and large, I mean, we did see ducks here and there but they are almost always mallard ducks. Um, wood pigeons were virtually everywhere. Uh, but the most interesting uh, ornithological thing we did see that I thought was fascinating was I saw some pink flamingos actually out in the middle of uh, the water off the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the east coast of Italy. And they were actually floating on the water and doing their tipping into the water with their filter feeding. And I didn't know flamingos could do that. I thought they didn't have those long legs that can swim and so on. Apparently they, they can swim. Um, anyway, uh, I um, overall uh, just a bit surprised, but I, I know that if I really made the trip all about birding and went to specific places, we could have seen some neat birds, including songbirds and so on. For example, we went to the Plavici National Park, and which is filled with uh, fast moving water or whatever and I found out later on that there are dippers there, the European uh, dipper and I would have loved to have seen one of those but I did not see one. Um, but by and large, um, uh, you know, the trip wasn't really all about going to see birds. The trip was all about um, the, the bird that's, the, the blonde bird that's holding the camera right now. Uh, I wanted her to have a good time and so we did the, the, the typical tourist trip through Italy and Croatia and uh, and it was celebrating 50 years of marriage together. 
and it was a it was a great trip and I'm hoping next time I go that I'll see more birds. Did you know that there are five species of titmice in North America, juniper and bridled in the southwest, oak titmice on the west coast, black crested titmice in Texas and Mexico. One of our photo contest judges, Steve Swearinger, has sent me many pictures of these beautiful titmice. But here on the east coast, it's the tufted titmouse, my most favorite backyard bird. They are sociable and fearless, and I just love their gray color. They're also called nuclear birds, not because they're about to explode anytime, but because other satellites tend to flock to them and hang out with them. Tufted titmice love chickadees and they get along with them really well, often mimicking each other's calls. They're also known as the backyard's herald because everyone tunes in to listen what these birds have to say. Even squirrels and chipmunks stop to listen to their warning calls. <laughs> And tufted titmice are always the first ones to the fight to drive a predator away. Tufted titmice are non-migratory and they can be found pretty much everywhere on the east coast, though they do love tall trees and dense canopy. Here we're at the northern tip of their range and normally in my backyard we only see them in the winter when they come to help themselves to nuts and suets. And actually they have been spotted more and more north because there are more people providing high energy foods like nuts and suet. Males and females are pretty much indistinguishable, even though males sometimes in the summer can be seen as slightly larger, but in the winter when they're all puffed up, you can't tell them apart at all. Tufted titmice's diet is 30% seeds, berries, uh, nuts, and the rest is animal, you know, insects and bugs. Even in the winter, they manage to find some bugs somewhere. And of course, they happily visit feeders with suet, sunflower seeds, and nuts in the winter. There was actually a study conducted that showed that tufted titmice that had access to bird feeders in the winter were healthier than the ones they were just foraging out in the wild. Tufted titmice are also known to cache their food just in case it gets too cold outside. Tufted titmice are cavity nesters. They happily take to birdhouses. They also happily use all the cavities that have been carved by downy and hairy woodpeckers. Have you seen those uh, funny videos of tufted titmice landing on dogs and cats and even humans and pulling their hair as their nesting material? So next year they start building their nests sort of uh, mid-March. If you have dog or cat hair or even your own, just leave all of this outside and tufted titmice will take care of it. Pairs that bond for the season might stay together for a couple of seasons, but it's not guaranteed. They also get helpers, other titmice that just come and help them raise their young. They normally have one brood per season, three to nine eggs, six is sort of a, an average a number. Both females and males feed and raise the young and the chicks fledge when they're 16 days old. <music> Before we announce the top five and the winners of our September photo contest, I thought I would talk about some of the rules that we have here. Well, first of all, this is not a professional photo contest. Everyone is welcome to participate. The most important thing is keeping to our monthly theme. The grand prize winner receives our whole package, which is a scroll buster plus, a weather guard, a pole adapter, and a seat buster seat tray. And the grand prize winner is not allowed to come back and participate for the rest of the year. Those who take the second and the third place are welcome to come back in two photo contests. So let's say if you take the second or the third place in September, you can come back in December. We also invite our winners to help us judge the entries on the following photo contests. And now let's check out the top five of Mockingbirds and Threshers photo contest.
Here's the third place. The second place. And the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. October is all about suet loving birds. Good luck, everyone. Well, that's it. That's all for now. I have to go and fill my bird feeders because they're empty again. Next episode is the upland sandpiper. Believe it or not, it's the only bird that starts with a U in North America. It's not the most widespread bird, but let's learn about it on the next episode. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks. Thank you.